Hi class. So this is the first of our author videos that I'm recording. So what I'm going to do in these videos is say a little bit about the author to give us some context. And then I'll talk a little bit about the literary work. So as you all know, the first reading I assigned is the short story, A Scandal in Bohemia by Arthur Conan Doyle. And as you probably noticed, right, this is kind of an old piece of literature, right? This piece of literature was published in 1891, so a very long time ago. Um, I did start with the longest of the short stories also, figuring that at the beginning of the semester, you probably have more time to read. So this is the longest of the short stories. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and share my screen to pull up my presentation on Arthur Conan Doyle. Okay, so I'm guessing maybe you've heard of him before, because I'm guessing also that some of you are probably familiar with the character Sherlock Holmes. So Arthur Conan Doyle lived from 1859 to 1930. He had a pretty long life, given the time period he was living in, 71 years of life. Um, also interesting about him is that in addition to being a published author, he had another career, right? He worked as a physician. Um, and he is best remembered as the creator of Sherlock Holmes, this character. So he's from Scotland. And when he was a child, he was sent to a Jesuit boarding school in England, which was really hard, right? They believed then in corporal punishment, which if you don't know what that is, basically it means they hit the children, right? They believed in like physical punishment. And his upbringing, he said, was very cold, right? Not a lot of love, not a lot of, not a lot of hugs. Um, he did pursue a medical career, partly because of the security that it provided in terms of a steady income. Um, the picture I have here on the screen uh, is of him with his first wife and their son and daughter. And unfortunately, his first wife died of tuberculosis. Um, the picture on the right is, is Arthur Conan Doyle, right? He did serve as a doctor during both the Boer War and also World War II. As I said, though, he's best known for writing these stories that feature the same protagonist, Sherlock Holmes. So he wrote four novels and 56 short stories about this character, right, and his, his assistant, Dr. Watson. And these works are very important because they're viewed as milestones in a genre that is very popular, right, detective and crime fiction. So these works were published in magazines, right? So right around the time that Arthur Conan Doyle was writing, there was this thing called the Education Act of 1870, which resulted in a rise in literacy rates, right? Prior to that, a lot of people couldn't read, right? They didn't, they just didn't know how to read. So more and more people were reading, people were starting to really get into reading. And so there were a lot of literary magazines, like the one on the left, Collier's, which published novels and short stories in a serialized format. So you might have noticed if you already read the story, right, it's divided up into chapters. There's chapter one, chapter two, chapter three. So like chapter one would be published one month and then you'd have to wait, right, for the next month to get the next chapter. And then just to show you, in case you're not familiar, right, that this character, Sherlock Holmes, right, really has captured the imagination of so many people. So there have been adaptations for the stage, right, film, and also television. So you might be familiar with some of these. I think probably the one uh, in the kind of the center of the screen with Robert Downey Jr. as Sherlock Holmes. I think that one's pretty popular. You might have seen it. I think it's on Netflix. Um, you might you might check it out. Okay, let me stop sharing. Okay, so that's my overview of the author. Um, let's see here. Anything else I wanted to say about him? There is actually a website, right? You can go to ArthurConanDoyle.com. He has a website. I have to say it's kind of disappointing. There's really not that much there, but if you want to check it out. Um, all right, so let's say a little bit about this story, A Scandal in Bohemia. Right. So as I said, this is an example of this genre that we call detective fiction. Right. So in this story, we see that Sherlock Holmes is presented with a problem. Right. And he's asked to solve it for a fee. Right. That's how he makes his living. 
And we see that Sherlock Holmes is this utterly rational detective, right, who uses a process of deduction, right, reason to try to solve this case that he's presented with. Okay, so, you know, usually when I talk about a work of literature, I always like to start off by saying something about the setting and also the point of view. So the setting refers to the time and also the place that the plot is focusing on. And so in this case, we can say, well, we actually know, right? Because he gives us the, the year, right? We know that the time of the plot is 1888. It's actually March of 1888. And we know that the place is London, right? He actually refers to specific places in London. So if you're from London, you're like, oh, I know where that is, right? Um, and then the point of view is the first person. Right. So it's told from the perspective of a single narrator, right, who uses the pronoun I, right, to refer to himself. So he's telling the story. And in this case, our first person narrator is a character named Dr. Watson. And so first person narr narration, I actually like the most. It's my favorite, right? Because I like to like be inside of someone's head and see the world from their perspective. But whenever we have a first person narrator, we always have to keep in mind that we only know what that person shares with us, right? What they tell us. And also because we're really like inside their head, we have to keep in mind that all of their biases, right? All of their like prejudices, their limitations, we also have while we're reading the story. Right. So thinking about Dr. Watson as the narrator, we kind of have to think, oh, well, does this guy have any biases? And the answer is yes, he does. Right. Because we know that he is extremely good friends with Sherlock Holmes. They've worked together in the past. Right. They are very close. And that Dr. Watson really admires Sherlock Holmes, right? He really kind of puts him on a pedestal. He's totally confident that Sherlock Holmes is going to be able to help the king out, right, to recover this photograph. He's very, you know, he, he just thinks that Sherlock Holmes is not going to go wrong, right? So we're kind of like, hmm, as we're reading, we're like, oh, we'll see how that goes. Okay, so as you're reading the story, if you haven't read it yet, really think about that. Think about how the fact that this is told from the first person, right, how that affects our interpretation of what's going on, right? Another reason why I chose this particular story for our first story is because this story illustrates a classic plot structure. So we start with an exposition, right? The exposition is the part of the plot where we get any necessary background information, right? The context. And we really do get that in this story, right? We find out a little bit about Sherlock Holmes right at the beginning of the story. And I'm actually going to pull up really quickly here if I can get to it quickly um, on my screen. Sorry, I'm new to, I'm new to making these videos, right? Um, I wanted to pull up the first page of the story. Sorry, I'm messing up already here. Let me see if I can find that. Excuse me, class. I thought I had it set up here, but I... Um, all right, you know what? I'm going to come back to that, right? I wanted to pull up the first passage of the story. I'll just, I have it on paper here. Forgive me. I'll just pull it up on paper until I get this figured out here. But the very first paragraph of the story, right? We get some really important information about Sherlock Holmes. And I'm just going to read like two sentences from that very first paragraph, right? So again, this is Dr. Watson telling us about Sherlock Holmes. And he says, right, right, that to Sherlock Holmes, she, is always the woman. And so like the first sentence, we're like, who are we talking about here? But we know this woman is gonna be very important, right? So we get some foreshadowing, right? We then come to find out he's talking about Irene Adler, right? But then he goes on to say, right? It was not that he felt any emotion akin to love for Irene Adler, all emotions, and that one particularly, were abhorrent to his cold, precise, but admirably balanced mind. He was, I take it, the most perfect reasoning and observing machine that the world has seen, but as a lover, he would have placed himself in a false position, right? He never spoke of the softer passions save with a gibe and a sneer, 
Okay, right. So kind of like, what do we get from this? Well, that Sherlock Holmes, like I said, he is this rational person, logic and reason and an emotion like love, Ah, right? That's abhorrent to him, right? So he, he doesn't speak of the softer passions, save with a gibe and a sneer. So he's basically not into like emotions and love. He's into logic and reason. And, and that's important for us to know about this character, right? Because it really does affect the way he approaches this case and also the way he thinks about Irene Adler, okay? And I'd also like to, you know, bring up, right, in any good plot, we need to have some conflict, right? That the conflict is what drives the plot. And in this story, right, after the exposition, the background information about the characters and the setting, then we get into the conflict, right? The conflict being that the king is afraid that he's about to be blackmailed by Irene Adler. So that's the conflict, right? He's got to recover this photograph. And I realized, you know, this story, again, it was published in 1891, kind of old, right? Some of the language that is used is not like the kind of language that we use today, right? It's a little bit more archaic. And so the photograph is referred to throughout the story as a cabinet photograph. When you're like, what is that? Well, if you Google it, right, you'll find that that refers to the size of the photograph. So it's a five by seven photograph, right, of the king and Irene Adler. Okay, again, we got to think about the setting, the time period, right? This is, you know, a long time ago. We might think, so what? The king was in a photograph with a beautiful young woman? Who cares, right? But and during this time period, right, that was scandalous because Irene Adler, right, the king says she's not of his station because we come to learn that she is a performer, right? She is a singer. She's an actress and a singer, right? And so, again, we might say today, right, Prince Harry, he married a woman who's an actress. What's the big deal, right? But in that time, right, for a woman to be a singer, that was kind of like scandalous. That wasn't something that like high class women did. It was viewed as sort of like beneath somebody who would be the king. So that's why this photograph is so, you know, potentially damaging to the king. He was engaged to someone else, right? He's got to get that photograph back. So that is the complication that drives the plot forward, right? Then we have the rising action where Sherlock Holmes is trying to get that photograph back. And then of course the climax, right? The moment of greatest tension where we, the reader, are on the edge of our seat. Is he going to get it, right? Because he knows where it is, right? Because she reveals where the photograph is, but he's so cocky and arrogant, right? That he thinks, oh, I'll come back and get it. Right? I'll come back tomorrow and get it, right? Of course, then as we know, it's that then it becomes too late, right? So we see this, again, this classic plot structure, right? At the end of the story, right? The denouement, the denouement, we, all of the questions are answered, right? We aren't um, left with any questions, right? This is a closed ending. We know what happened to the photograph. We know what happened to Irene Adler. And we know that Sherlock Holmes was outsmarted by this woman, okay? Another thing I want you to think about, right, as you reflect on this story is who's the protagonist? Who's the antagonist, right? These are literary terms that we will use throughout the semester, right? Protagonist is the central character in a literary work. You know, sometimes we call it the main character. Usually it's the character that we kind of are rooting for, right? We want that character to be successful, right? We want that character to be happy and to get what they want, right? And then the antagonist is the villain, right? The force that opposes the protagonist, right? It's not always a character. Sometimes it might be a force, right? Like racism or sexism or something like that. But in this case, right, the antagonist is a character. But who is it, right? At the beginning of the story, I think the way it's set up, we assume, oh, it's Irene Adler, right? She's the antagonist, right? Because she's the force that is opposing the king, right? She's trying to blackmail him, right? And I think also, I'm just, Again, I have to use my paper copy until I figure out how to share, share the screen in the correct way, right? So when we first hear about Irene Adler, right, this is on page six of the, of the PDF, right, that I've shared with you, right? The way she's described by the king, it says, you know, she's threatening to sell the photograph. You do not know her, right? She has the face of the most beautiful of women and the mind of the most resolute of men, 
rather than I should marry another woman, there are no lengths to which she would go, none, right? So it kind of sounds like initially she's this jealous, right, vindictive woman, right, who's trying to like get back at the king. So she seems kind of like the antagonist, right? But as we read the story, you know, maybe, you know, our thoughts might shift, right? Maybe we're kind of like, hmm, after, after we read on and we get to know more, we might be thinking, hmm, well, I'm not exactly sure if by the end of the story, I feel that way, right? Because in the letter at the end of the story that she writes to Sherlock Holmes, right, when she refers to the king, right, Irene says that she has been, quote, cruelly wronged, right, by the king. And so we don't really know, right? We'll never know what really happened between them. But it kind of like, I feel like the story sort of complicates the idea of protagonist and antagonist, okay? It's a little bit blurry. Um, okay, I'm trying to keep these videos short here. So I guess I'll wrap up this uh, video by just saying, you know, one of the things that you should always do after you finish reading a story or a poem or any work of literature is ask yourself, right, what is the theme of this work, right? What is the main point, right? What is the general idea or insight that the author is trying to convey? Okay, and that's kind of a hard question, right? Because I think a good work of literature is going to have more than one theme, right? So hmm, if we kind of think, what is the theme of this work? I mean, I think one theme that kind of jumps out to me, right? Because we see that, as I said, Sherlock Holmes is outsmarted by this woman who throughout the story, Sherlock Holmes had kind of a very, you know, condescending attitude towards her, right? And not just her, women in general, right? Just the idea that he's going to outsmart her. And I think that by the end of the story, we see, well, you know, maybe uh, you should not underestimate the cleverness of women or other people in particular, right? So that could be one of the themes. And then also, I think in the story, right, if Sherlock Holmes is meant to represent reason and logic, right, and Irene is sort of like meant to represent in some ways emotion, right, love that we kind of see this juxtaposition of the two. And again, Irene Adler is the character who outsmarts the, the, king, the king and and Sherlock Holmes. So in a sense, I think maybe the story also suggests, right, um, that, you know, we shouldn't uh, underestimate people who are emotional, right, who, who experience love. You know, those are just some, some ideas. So anyway, our first work of literature, I hope you enjoy reading this story. You know, if you like it, you might, you know, decide that you'd like to read more Sherlock Holmes stories. Um, I do want to just say this one is kind of an anomaly in the sense that this is really, as far as I know anyway, the only Sherlock Holmes story where Sherlock Holmes doesn't like successfully solve the case. So this, this one is a little bit different, right? But I feel like that's what makes it a little bit more, um, more interesting. All right. Well, I can't wait to read your thoughts on the discussion board about the story, and I'll see you next time.